Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hey, everybody. September is National Family Meals Month and National Fruits and Veggies Month. So please stay tuned after the episode for some important information and resources. Also, if you like the podcast, and I hope you do, please share it with others and sign up for my newsletter at soundbitesrd.com so you never miss an episode or an update. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at MelissaJoyRD and consider leaving me a review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much. Enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites Podcast. Today's episode is about cannabis and CBD, and will hopefully provide you with some credible evidence-based information, dispel some common myths, and also decrease some of the stigma surrounding these and their use. Now, this episode has been a long time coming, so I'm really excited to tell you that my guest today is Janice Bissix. She's had a varied career as a cardiac rehab dietitian, a nutrition software salesperson, a dietitian for the U.S. Senate, a consultant at a luxury hotel, a food blogger, a radio podcaster, and a cookbook author. She was also the recipient of the 2015 Media Excellence Award from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Her work life took an unexpected turn a few years ago, and I'm so delighted to welcome Janice here to talk about her new career as a trailblazer in the burgeoning field of holistic cannabis consulting. Welcome to the show, Janice. It is a pleasure to join you, Melissa. Finally. No, right? <laughs> we have been planning this for what, a couple of years now. A couple of years, yes, and something keeps coming up, so I'm glad we're finally speaking. Well, thank you for your patience. Usually it's me. We met many years ago, maybe about 10. Mm -hmm. I knew we would be really good friends after that one time. I think we were in Prague, somewhere in Europe, when I stole your coat. You did, yes. You were so nice about it. (laughs) (laughs) Wasn't I? Yeah, you were great. I very politely said, oh, I believe you have my coat. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's how you said it. And how could I confuse the two? Because I had bought mine at Costco, and yours was Land's End. It felt... (laughs) So much nicer than my Costco coat. But I digress. Now, you were actually on the show before, way back on episode 13 with Liz Weiss, talking about your work as the Meal Makeover Moms and the Cooking with Moms podcast, which was one of the very first, if not the first, dietitian hosted podcast. And you've come a long way, baby. (laughs) Yes, I have. (laughs) Now, that podcast was around for how many years and how many episodes? We started, I believe, in 2008, and we were at just under 300 episodes. Wow. I think we were at 298 or 299. Wow. I know we should have probably done that last episode, but <laughs> yeah. Life moves on, and our careers evolve, and new horizons, and, and all of that good stuff. I'd love for you to give us some background on kind of going all the way back to how you even became interested in nutrition. And a little bit about your work background or history before we talk about your new, quote unquote, new, fairly new, relatively work with cannabis. And of course, I want to hear your compelling story. I've heard it, but I'd love for you to share with the listeners your compelling story about how you made that and why you made that transition. Mm -hmm. So how I first became interested in nutrition, wow, in my undergraduate uh, studies, I was a microbiology major. And I took as an elective intro to food and nutrition when I was a sophomore. And the professor was Catherine Musgrave. And after one class, I said to myself, this is what I want. Forget microbiology. I want to be a nutritionist. So I followed her back to her office. I really did a little puppy dog. And I said, I want to change my career. Will you be my advisor? And thank goodness she said yes. And we became and were friends until her death. And she was in her 90s when she died. Oh, my goodness. She was still a guest on a weekly radio show, Melissa. Oh, my gosh. Up until a month before she died. The woman was a firecracker. And she had so much passion for what she did that she just inspired me. Oh, 
How wonderful. It's really nice when we have those special teachers or mentors. I have a similar story. A lot of dietitians do where it was either a certain class or a certain professor or advisor that it just clicks for you. And then to be able to maintain that relationship all those years, that's just so Mm -hmm. wonderful. The only thing that I regret is that she isn't here seriously to see what I'm doing now because everything I did, she said, I am so proud of you. And I think she would really be interested in this career, in this new sort of uh, turn or uh, change or change of direction in my career. I'm sure she knows. I'm sure she's watching Mm -hmm. over you and she is very proud, I'm sure. You had such a varied background and varied career, which as I always say on the podcast is just such a wonderful thing about the field of dietetics, but you've really pushed those boundaries. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Sure. I, As you mentioned, I went, the last thing that I was doing is with Meal Makeover Moms, and Liz and I had a radio podcast and a food blog, and we gave a lot of talks. We basically taught people, we wrote several books, teaching people how to eat a healthy diet. And then four years ago, my dad had uh, some health issues, and he had a lot of pain. He had multiple spinal fractures. And so the doctors gave him the traditional pain meds that you give to people. And he was a very active guy. He loved hiking in the woods and just very active, energetic man. And he didn't like that they made him groggy. These pain mm-hmm. meds just made him groggy and severely constipated. Mm-hmm. Now, no one ever talks about that. We all know it's a, a side effect of many pain meds, but mm-hmm. it got so bad it required a hospitalization. Mm-hmm. And after that, I said to his doctor, really, is there anything else we can do for his pain? And I said, what about medical marijuana? Because I had heard it had just become legalized in Massachusetts. Now, I knew nothing about, in fact, I'm not going to lie, I used to use air quotes around the medical (laughs) marijuana. I did. I grew up in the just say no to drugs generation. Mm. When I was a senior in college, from my freshman year, my friends, they smoked pot. It was pot back then. I guess it's weed now. (laughs) Apparently, there's a lot of different terms. Yes, there are. Yes. But they would smoke a lot. And they're, come on, Newell, come on, let's go. You got to try it. And I was like, nope, I was too busy getting my 4.0, just studying and it's all business. (laughs) So when I was a senior, I called my mother and I said, mom, you know what? I've never smoked pot before. And I'm afraid if I leave college, I'll never get the opportunity. So I'm going to try it tonight. (laughs) You told your mother? I did. And of course, you know, I was a type A, goody two-shoe. She said, okay, honey, just be safe. Oh. So I did. I tried it once, didn't like it. And then I never, it didn't cross my path again until I was in my 50s. Wow. And so when my dad's doctor said, yes, I think that's a great idea, I thought, oh, now I have to learn about this. So I did in true dietitian fashion. I started doing research. And the more I learned, the more I thought, are you kidding me? This has been used medicinally for 5,000 years and I don't know about it. So we got dad certified, took him to the dispensary. He was in a lot of pain. We came home, figured out how to put the vape pen together. He took a couple of puffs and he stood up and he said, I'm going to go take a nap. So he stood up and he said, wow. And I said, are you okay? Are you dizzy? He said, I'm not in pain. Wow. And that was the moment that I decided to change my career. I went back to school to become a holistic canvas practitioner. And now that's all I do. That's all I do is I counsel people about how they can use mostly CBD, sometimes cannabis and lifestyle changes to manage anxiety, depression, pain, insomnia, irritable bowel, just a host of conditions that can be helped with uh, CBD and cannabis. Mm, Excellent. I've seen you present on this topic. And actually, I think I have a funny picture of you holding up your fake, I don't know, (laughs) marijuana plant (laughs) that you took through the airport, which had been a very interesting story. (laughs) That was fun. (laughs) But it's my understanding, actually, I just yesterday came across my desk an article In the Association for Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, there's a magazine called In Practice. So there's an article on cannabis with relation to diabetes. And in that article, it said, according to a 2019 Gallup survey, one in seven Americans said they personally use CBD-containing products. So that was about 14% of the people surveyed. 
and they cite relief from pain, anxiety, yes. insomnia, and arthritis as the top reasons. Yes. So I, even though I've seen you present and I've seen a little bit about it here and there, as you can imagine, like a lot of our listeners, I really don't know much of anything. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to go through some of the basics with you, knowing that about half my audience are healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. dietitians, nurses, diabetes educators, but also about half my audience are just the general public. Mm -hmm. And we're all consumers. So I'd love to kind of get like, I was going to say the 411, but what is <laughs> the 420? The 420. On, okay, uh, I have to tell you a funny story about the 420. Okay. When my daughter was about 15 years old, her friend's mother called me and said, Janice, I just want you to know that your daughter has 420 on her listed on her Instagram page. And mm. I said, what does that mean? Mm. She said, Janice, that's a reference to marijuana. I said, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know what it meant right. five years ago. So that's how little I knew right. about cannabis. So I'll give you the big picture. And I think that's what I love about seeing you present about it and learning from you is you do come from knowing nothing to yes. having educated yourself and becoming certified in this. And there's all kinds of information, everything from what is cannabis and CBD? What is it used for? How can you safely use it dosing and all of that? But there's also like legal and regulatory stuff. And I'd like to touch on some of that a little bit, okay? because there's medical marijuana. And then I think I know it varies from state to state. But now some states, and I believe Illinois, where I live, is mm -hmm. recreational use is legal. Mm -hmm. Whatever you feel we need to know, we're okay. going to hopefully touch on. And if I don't ask about it, please do interject. But maybe the best place to start is just what is cannabis and what is CBD? Is it the same as marijuana? I believe that THC is a psychoactive component. So I know that you're going to explain the differences there. Mm -hmm. Okay. First of all, cannabis is the mother plant. Marijuana is a slang term. Okay. So I don't use that. Okay. I try not to use that, I should say. So we have the cannabis plant. Hemp is in the same family as the cannabis plant, but hemp has very little THC, less than 0.3%. So the hemp plant has the cannabinoids and the other compounds that are found in the cannabis plant with almost no THC. As you said, THC is the compound that makes you high, it makes you stoned, if you overuse it. It's like if you have a glass of wine at dinner, you're not drunk. If you have a bottle of wine at dinner, you probably will be drunk. Mm. It's the same thing with THC. If you use a little bit of THC, you're not going to get high or stoned. Interesting. So that's something important. So we have cannabis and we have hemp. Both plants have cannabinoids. So THC is a cannabinoid. CBD is a cannabinoid. There's also CBC, CBG. There's THCA, CBDA, which are the raw forms, the acid forms of the cannabinoids. So the plant has all these compounds called cannabinoids. The plant also has what's called terpenes. So terpenes give the plant its smell, the aroma. If you smell lavender, what you're smelling, that nice calming smell, that's from linalool. That's a terpene that's found in lavender. It's also found in cannabis. Hmm. If you break open an orange and you get that really fresh citrus smell, that's from limonene. Limonene is also found in cannabis. Hmm. So all plants have terpenes. So cannabis has terpenes and also flavonoids, antioxidants, which are found in what? Fruits and vegetables. We tell people eat more fruits and vegetables because of all these healthy things. So cannabis is a plant. It has all of these different compounds that work synergistically. So when you, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but when you talk about a CBD product, if you use a CBD isolate product, it's like just pulling out that CBD molecule out of the plant that's not really going to give you the benefit mm. of the full plant. It's like, Melissa, if I say to you, okay, I'm a dietitian, Melissa, you really should be eating more broccoli because it, it's good for you. But you know what? Why don't you just take a vitamin A capsule? Mm -hmm. No, 
it's not the same. Exactly. So we want full plant products because all of those compounds work well together. Okay. So that's what's in the plant. Cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids. They work together. In each of the terpenes, so for example, the uh, I told you that the linalool is very calming. Myrcene is another terpene. It's very sedating. So you might want more myrcene if you're using CBD or cannabis to get some rest for sleep. Mm -hmm. A lot of people turn to cannabis or CBD because they have issues with sleep. Mm -hmm. There are so many different cultivars of cannabis. You may have heard some of the, you know, sour diesel and all the different, people call them strains. Uh, That's, again, it's really cultivars. Mm -hmm. So, and it depends, the cultivars you have to look at, oh, what are the cannabinoids in there? What are the terpenes in there? As opposed to saying, oh, sativa versus indica, which is what a lot of people, when they say, oh, cannabis, the, the sativa is more energizing and the indica is more indicouch. Mm-hmm. It's more sedating. That's how people, <laughs> that's a general guideline. But because of all the hybridization, you really have to look more closely at the terpenes and the different cannabinoid ratios. Okay. So, That's a lot of science and it's like pharmacology (laughs) and it's making me realize, you know, your roots were in microbiology, (laughs) although this is maybe horticulture. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's not lost on me then that there are many different parts of the plant that have different functions Mm -hmm. and there are different benefits associated with these different parts of the plant. And so then comes the question whether you're just a consumer or a healthcare professional, how do we even begin to navigate all of the different aspects, the different products, the different usages? I know that that's what you do in in your daily work, Mm -hmm. but I don't want to jump ahead. Is that the next logical place to talk about after this 411 or the 420 that we got on cannabis? We, We can go there, absolutely. And then we can go back and forth. I want to talk a little bit about the history of cannabis use. Let's talk about that first then. Okay. So the history, as I mentioned, it's been used medicinally for 5,000 years. When you look at old writings, they say it's used for female problems. It was used for gastrointestinal issues. So people who had nausea or GI upset, they would use cannabis. Queen Victoria used a cannabis tincture for her menstrual cramps. Cannabis was in the pharmacopoeia, which is the book where doctors refer to and healthcare professionals for dosing information on medications. Cannabis was a part of many, many medicines in the 1800s up until the uh, early 1900s. It was removed from the pharmacopoeia in 1942. So it was used medicinally. Doctors used it. It was all going fine until the early 1900s, and then we had prohibition. Mm. And there are many factors that really contributed to vilifying cannabis, and they were not scientific or medical. It was political and racial. Mm. So we had Mexican immigrants who came over in the early 1900s. The guy that was in charge of prohibition, when prohibition was over, he was out of a job. So he needed something else to vilify, and he chose cannabis. He called it marijuana to give it a Mexican-sounding name. Mm. And he assured himself a job because they essentially made cannabis illegal in 1937. They imposed a tax that was just so high that nobody could afford it. And he was a very, he was a racist. He said really terrible things about people who smoked cannabis. So it was made illegal. Doctors fought against it. The medical associations fought against it. They said, you're taking a tool out of our toolbox here Mm. that is used for so many conditions. But it stayed. And then in the 1970s with the whole just say no to drugs and Nixon, and, and they put cannabis in the Schedule One category of drugs along with heroin and said that it has no medical benefit and a high potential for abuse, both of which are untrue. Mm. Cannabis actually can help people get off of narcotics and opioids. So it was a tragedy. And I didn't realize that 
until I did a lot of research. This medicine has been really not available for the last 80 years, but it was used for 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that in the coming months and years that cannabis will become legal nationwide. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if you had told me this five years ago, I would have said, oh, no, (laughs) we don't want that drug to be made legal. Look at the issues and the violence that occur because it's illegal. Mm. In states where it's become legal, one, teen use decreases, which seems crazy, but that is what they showed in uh, Colorado. Mm. It's been legal in Colorado. The teens don't want it anymore because now all the old people are (laughs) using it. (laughs) So that's something. And also overdose deaths from opioids Mm. decrease 25 to 30% when states legalize cannabis because people can use cannabis to help with their pain so they can lower their dose of opioids. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. And also CBD in particular can help people get off opioids because it helps to manage the anxiety and cravings. Nobody wants to be an opioid addict. Mm. People become addicted to these because it is physically addictive. And when you try to stop, you have such terrible symptoms. Mm -hmm. So CBD has really helped a lot of people get off of opioids. Thank you for sharing the history, because as you're telling it, I do recall you sharing that in the most recent presentation I saw you do. And I do think it is very important and telling to share that history so that we have a better understanding of how some of the stigma came about and can look at it in less of a political and stigmatized way and right. look at it more in a scientific way. Mm-hmm. And I remember you talking about that people think of cannabis as a gateway drug, but you used a term, or you had this phrase, and I can't remember yes. what it was. It's not a gateway drug. It actually kind of does the opposite. It's an exit herb. Exit herb. Yes. Right. It's really profound how it can help people Mm -hmm. uh, get off of opioids. Now, you've mentioned CBD. So I want you to explain what that is in comparison to cannabis, because I know I don't quite uh, understand that myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So CBD is, as I mentioned, one of the cannabinoids in the cannabis or hemp plants. People say it's the non-psychoactive compound. It's not technically true because it's non-intoxicating. So it will not make you high, it will not make you stoned, but it does have some psychoactivity because it's neurocalming. Mm. So it can decrease anxiety and calm really your nervous system. So it does have some psychoactivity. CBD, there are like 85 different actions at the cellular level of how CBD can really help people. But let's talk big picture We all have what's called an endocannabinoid system. It's a system of neurotransmitters. We have receptors from head to toe. And you might say, why would we have a system that accepts cannabinoids from a plant? That doesn't really make sense. The reason is that we make at least two cannabinoids on our own. You're sitting there, Melissa, right now, and you're making anandamide, and you're making 2-AG. These are two cannabinoids that are always in our system. Anandamide, it's the Sanskrit word for bliss, the bliss molecule. Mm. So anandamide, it's a little bit like serotonin. It's a feel-good molecule. So we want more anandamide. Right now, goodness gracious, we could all use more anandamide in our blood. Amen. So how do we get more anandamide? You can exercise. Now they're thinking that the runner's high is not endorphins, it's because your anandamide levels increase. So you can exercise to increase your anandamide, you can eat a healthy diet, or you can take CBD. So what CBD does is it decreases the enzyme that breaks down anandamide. Hmm. So it allows your body to retain more of this feel-good molecule. So it's almost like People who, uh, they don't make enough thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. They take a thyroid medicine, right? They don't have a problem with that. Some people just genetically don't make as much anandamide. And they suffer from a higher incidence of anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. So if you can give them something that allows their body to retain more anandamide and decrease their anxiety and depression by working with their own endocannabinoid system, 
Mm-hmm. How cool is that? Yeah. That reminds me of like serotonin in the brain. Yes. Yes. So CBD also, it potentiates those serotonin receptors. So it can increase the serotonin levels. It decreases cortisol levels, those stress, Mm -hmm. uh, the stress cortisol levels. And it also increases something called GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So again, a calming neurotransmitter. So that's what we want. We want more of those and less of those excitatory Mm -hmm. neurotransmitters. And interestingly, back in the late 1990s, uh, scientists at the National Institutes of Health were doing research to see what compounds might help with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, these neurodegenerative disorders. And they found that the most promising was cannabinoids, CBD and other cannabinoids. So they applied for and received a patent on CBD. Wow. As an antioxidant and neuroprotectant. So we have these cannabinoids that have been proven to be helpful for Alzheimer's. Uh, CBD actually protects that myelin insulation of our nerve fibers. THC decreases those amyloid plaques that develop in Alzheimer's. There is so much compelling research. People say, oh, there's not enough research. There is a lot of research. Do we need more research? Double-blind, placebo-controlled studies? You bet we do. But guess what? Cannabis is a Schedule One substance. So universities and people, different places that get federal funding, don't want to take the risk of doing research. So we need to Mm. legalize the plant so we can do more studies. They do a lot of really good research in Israel. They have fabulous research. CBD with autism, very compelling research showing, I think it was an 86% improvement in behavior in kids who had severe autism. Wow. And then Sanjay Gupta, he did a, a documentary. He was not in favor of cannabis at all because he went to med school. He didn't learn about it. He didn't learn about the endocannabinoid system. Did you learn about it in your internship, Melissa? No. No, no, neither did I. So CNN, they asked him, they said, they asked him, he works for CNN, they said, we want you to do a documentary on the use of CBD in epilepsy in children. Mm -hmm. And he was hesitant. He did it. And he completely changed his tune about cannabis and CBD and the medical value. He was our opening speaker a couple of years ago at our annual conference, and he used the word cannabis three times. Mm-hmm. You may not have noticed, but I did. You were counting. Oh, yes, I was. So he's a big proponent right now. And I think that once people do the research and learn, or even more importantly, once you or someone you love finds relief using CBD or cannabis, then you start to believe. Mm -hmm. Then you start to understand the power of this plant. And until then, many of us still have the same stigmas that, frankly, I had up until four years ago. Mm -hmm. Right. Then it becomes a lot more personal, a lot closer to home. Yes. Let's talk about some of, you've touched on uh, many different barriers. There's the history that most people aren't aware of that has contributed to the stigma. There's a lot of misunderstanding about the science and the plant and drugs and being a schedule one, is that what you yes. called it? Schedule one drug. But there's also the uh, legal and regulatory. And like I said, I know it varies, but I'm sure you can kind of give us the top line. Is it not legal federally, but then states can legalize it? Yes, for cannabis. It's illegal federally, but 33 states have legalized it for medical use. And then 11, maybe 12 by now, have legalized what I call adult use. A lot of people say recreational use. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that a lot of people who go to these, quote, recreational cannabis shops are there because they suffer from pain. Mm -hmm. They suffer from anxiety. They have trouble sleeping. That's why a lot of people turn to cannabis. It's really, it's tragic that this is not available to everyone nationwide, that there are still, what we have 33, 34, so we still have 16 states where it's illegal to use cannabis, even if, even if you have a condition that there is compelling research could be helped Mm -hmm. by cannabis use. 
you cannot access it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people who have moved their families because they have children who have epilepsy or conditions that require cannabis. They leave their state and move to a state where it's legal. Wow. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. And the other barrier is the lack of acceptance or embracing from the medical community, Yes, which like you said, I think is gradually changing with this example mm -hmm. with Sanjay Gupta. And really in the work that you're doing is very helpful in educating other healthcare professionals. Because if you're a person who suffers from one of these conditions that CBD cannabis could help alleviate, but your doctor doesn't know anything about it or has a negative yes. impression of it. When you asked your father's doctor, you know, is there anything else we can do? And he was like, not really. And you said, what about mar medical marijuana? And he's, I think that's a great idea. I mean, what if he had said, oh, no, that's not. Do you know what, Melissa? I think about that all the yeah. time. If he had said, oh, no, I would not be doing this work. No. Not at all. You wouldn't have been inspired to, no. gee, I guess I better learn about it now because you would right. have said, okay, well, that's not an option. Right. And I have a very good friend whose mom has lots of pain and anxiety. She's in her late 80s. And they went to the doctor and asked. The doctor said, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. So, And that door gets shut. Exactly. Exactly. So that it's really, it's unfortunate. But I have to say, more and more doctors are becoming open to this because okay. they're learning more. Right. You can't not realize and read about some of these studies and they hear from patients. Mm -hmm. So the patients come in and say, well, you know, I use CBD. I rubbed it on my knee and I couldn't walk before and now I can walk. Mm. And the doctor says, oh, really? Mm. Tell me more. So now I have, oh gosh, over a dozen local doctors here who refer their patients to me. Wow who have uh, pain or, or anxiety or mm -hmm. other conditions. But let me circle back to the legality okay. because we talked about cannabis. So that's cannabis. CBD is different. So the 2018 Farm Bill made hemp production, the commercial production of hemp, legal. Before that, it wasn't. It's caused a big increase in the number of CBD products. So people say, well, is CBD legal nationwide? And the answer is yes, but... There are a couple of states where it's a little bit of a gray area, and I think it's maybe Nebraska and one other state, South Dakota maybe. Now, they've said, the people in, in those states have said, we're not looking to, to arrest anyone who is using CBD to manage a condition. It's just officially they haven't come out to legalize it. So for all intents and purposes, CBD is certainly available nationwide and pretty well accepted. The TSA came out and said, as far as traveling, it's 100% legal to travel with any CBD product. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's a good thing that mm -hmm. helped a lot of people feel better about it. Because I have a lot of my clients who say, I'm going whatever, and I don't want to be without my CBD. Can I? And I say, yes, you can. You can travel with it. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Melissa, is the greatest increase in uh, use? What age group? I was going to say for pets, but... <laughs> oh, well, pets, that's also uh, really growing a lot, too. Uh, I yeah. have C CBD pet shoes. Uh, in fact, I was walking with my dog this morning with a friend, and uh, my dog, my little dachshund, mini dachshund, was not putting pressure on her uh, foot, her paw. And my friend Mary said, did you give her CBD today? I said, oh, gee, no, I didn't. I'll have to do that one again. <laughs> <laughs> have you given it to her before? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was just like, you know, oh, I never yeah. thought of that. For situations like fireworks or if there are yeah. going to be a lot of people, a high stress situation, I give her a little yeah. CBD treat or if she's uh, in pain. Yeah. Well, and I know you were asking what age people, but I did want to address the pet issue because my, my Roscoe passed away three years ago. But oh, when I go to the store and I see all the CBD stuff for pets, I think, mm. oh, he would have so yeah, benefited yeah, from that. He I was know. a ball of anxiety all the time talking about yeah. the fireworks and things that just got, he was 16 when he passed, but it got worse with age. And yes, he also had pain from, you know, his hips and spinal stenosis mm -hmm. and stuff. But mm -hmm. thankfully, he was pretty darn healthy right up until the, the last day. But I oh. do think about that. No, I've worked with a lot of pets, pet owners yeah. at the end of the pets lives. And they've said, thank you for giving us a week or two with no pain. Right. They could actually get up. And yeah, you know, so that's nice. That makes perfect sense. I, I totally see that. But as far as your question about 
the age group, but did you the say that? The fastest increase in uh, cannabis use. What age? Probably menopausal age. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's actually a very good uh, good guess, but it's uh, age sixty five and older. Oh, that makes half sense. Of, yeah, half of people over the age of sixty five, more than half s- complain they've had pain in the last month. Right. And so it's not a coincidence. That's the fastest growing. People mm-hmm. are saying, "Wow, if I can get relief using some CBD or some cannabis, then let's try that before mm-hmm. going to the pharmaceuticals that come with just a whole slew of side effects." Right. Well, and I do want to talk about that. It, clearly, pain and anxiety are two conditions that can really be debilitating. So sometimes these people become desperate mm-hmm. and think about alternative therapies and things like that. Why should this be any different? Mm-hmm. As long as do no harm sort of a thing to give it a try. But you mentioned medications that have side effects. Are there side effects with cannabis and CBD and or drug nutrient interactions or drug interactions? Mm -hmm. Good question. So the side effects of CBD, let's talk about that first. The most common, even though most people don't experience side effects taking CBD, the most common side effect is more vivid dreams. Mm -hmm. People say, wow, I wake up and I can really remember my dreams more. Mm -hmm. Second is people say the first week or two, some people say they feel a little bit fatigued. Now that goes away once your body adjusts to it. But I think it's partly that neurocalming effect. It brings you down one notch. And if you're used to riding high. Yeah, exactly. So they say, man, I could take a nap this afternoon. Interesting. The other thing, because CBD is a vasodilator, which means it opens up your blood vessels, which is a good thing. You get more blood to your heart, more blood to your brain, which Mm -hmm. we could all use. But Mm -hmm. um, some people, if they have very low blood pressure, they could feel a little bit of lightheadedness. Okay. So that's just something to be aware of. There was one study of elderly clients who said that 9% said that they felt a little lightheaded. So I always tell my clients that just to be, I've only had one out of hundreds of clients, uh, one elderly gentleman who said that he felt a little bit dizzy. And then dry mouth, I've never had a client tell me that the CBD caused dry mouth, but with THC, with cannabis, that is pretty common mm. that people get a dry mouth. And when I remember I mentioned that vasodilator, when you see someone who has smoked cannabis and they have the bloodshot eyes, that's because their vessels, the blood vessels are opening up. Oh. I never knew that. I just, I, huh. I learned that. It's like, oh, that's why they have bloodshot eyes. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, and you mentioned smoked. Uh, I know that a lot of people think, I don't want to smoke this stuff because I don't want to inhale stuff in my lungs. And I was surprised to learn from you all of the variety of different ways um, that you can take CBD. And I've heard of CBD oil and edibles. I want you to address edibles because I heard those are popular on college campuses and things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about all the different ways to administer? Yes. So honestly, none of my clients smoke they either use a tincture. So there are tinctures that you can put under your tongue. You hold it for a minute or two, swish it around in your mouth and swallow. It's absorbed in about 15 minutes, lasts for about four or five hours. Then I also have a water-soluble CBD product that you put a few drops in a little bit of water. You drink it. That's actually very fast acting. It takes effect in just a few minutes. Uh, So a lot of people like that because it's fast acting and very effective and highly bioavailable because it's a nano emulsion technology. Hmm. And then there are soft gels, which is the same as an edible. You just, it's like a little vitamin E pill. You swallow it. It goes through your GI system. It's absorbed. It goes to your liver for metabolism. And this is where we talk about drug interactions. So if you take an edible or if you take a soft gel, it's absorbed, goes to your liver to be broken down by these, it's called the CYP450 enzyme system. Okay, so we have CYP450 enzymes. It breaks down things like Coumadin. So if I have a client who's on Coumadin on a blood thinner, Mm -hmm. and they want to take CBD, if they took an edible or a soft gel at the exact same time, it's possible that they could both get to the liver, and the liver is going to say, hey, I only have so much of this enzyme. So I'm going to break down either you or you, which could cause an increase or decrease in the Coumadin level in someone's blood. Now, Coumadin has a pretty narrow therapeutic window. 
So we don't want to mess around with a drug like that. Mm -hmm. There are some medications that if it's increased or decreased by a couple of percent, not really a big deal. But if someone's on Coumadin in particular, I usually steer them towards a tincture or I'll make sure that they take the Coumadin in the morning and the CBD at night. Mm -hmm. People also can use a topical CBD and you just put it right where it hurts. So if I give you a, a salve, Melissa, because your knee hurts and you put it on your knee, it's not going to help your shoulder pain. <laughs> it just is absorbed. It doesn't even go into the bloodstream for the most part. It just offers regionalized pain relief, which if someone has migraines, TMJ, psoriasis, eczema, bug bites, cuts, arthritic pain, joint pain, neuropathy, a topical could be a really good choice. Interesting. So with the tincture, did I say that right? Tincture? Mm -hmm. okay. Tincture, yes. Is that just, that doesn't go through the digestion, that's just absorbed through the skin? It's absorbed through your the membranes in your mouth and mm -hmm. goes directly into your blood. Oh. So it avoids that first pass metabolism in the liver. Okay. So before we leave edibles, when you talked about college campuses, cannabis edibles, THC edibles, if you've talked to anyone who says, I've had a really bad experience with cannabis, I'm going to venture to guess that they used an edible. Edibles are really, really tricky. Mm -hmm. They're good in one respect because they offer long-term relief from pain. However, when you take an edible that has THC in it and it's absorbed, goes to your liver, what happens is some of that Delta-9 THC is actually changed into 11-hydroxy THC, which is, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it's way more intoxicating. Mm -hmm. So when people take an edible, first of all, someone gives them a cookie, and they say, oh, this is an edible, you'll love it. You take a few bites, and you wait 20 or 30 minutes, and you say, really, Melissa, there was, there's nothing in there, so I'm going to take a few more bites. They don't feel anything. They just eat the whole cookie. Mm -hmm. The problem with edibles is it can take two hours to feel the effect. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, someone has taken a dose that is so high that they become paranoid. Their heart starts racing. The, the mouth goes bone dry. They become almost an out-of-body experience. It's very uncomfortable. People call 911 sometimes when they've eaten edibles because they think they're going to die. <laughs> now, no one has ever died of a cannabis overdose. Let me just tell you that. Interesting. But if you overdo it on an edible, you might think you're going to die. Mm -hmm. So in, in 911 operators are used to this and they'll say, did you take an edible? Yes. Okay. Lie down on the couch. Wait a couple of hours. You're fine. So that's something with edibles. And when you go to a dispensary and buy an edible, oftentimes they're in 10 milligram THC portions. That is way too much okay. for someone who has not used an edible or cannabis before. So anyone who wants to try it, fine. Please start with 2.5 milligrams. Break that thing into quarters and take 2.5 and don't take any more that day. Mm. If you say, okay, that was okay, well, then maybe try five. Ten, absolutely, for a novice, will just knock you off your sock. It just <laughs> will. So be very careful. Well, that brings up an important point about dosage and tolerance. Yes. And it sounds like, depending on the mode of administration and the particular makeup of that product mm -hmm. and the amount, the dosage, of course, there's a lot going on there. So how do people know how much to take and what mode would be best, obviously talking mm. with an expert like you. Yes. This is the work that you do. But if you kind of want to kind of give a general idea, mm -hmm. you touched on the tolerance issue, but you could explain that more. Let me just say the tolerance. If you take THC, you will develop tolerance. So that edible that at five milligrams maybe really makes you completely stoned. And if you did that every day in six months, your body would get used to that and you would actually need more to see the same effect. That doesn't happen with CBD. Oh. You don't develop a tolerance, which is great. So once yeah. you find your dose, that should be your dose. Interesting. Now, how do you find your dose? It does depend on the format of what you're taking. True. It depends on your body weight. It depends on your genetics. It depends on so many things. I have clients who get relief with four milligrams of tincture. That helps them sleep. They're good. I have some who need 25 milligrams 
mm-hmm. 50 milligrams, 30 milligrams. It's so individual. So that this is the rule. Start low mm-hmm. and go slow. Mm-hmm. So start, I always start my clients on a small dose to see how they respond to it. Mm-hmm. So if it's a tincture, I'll say, okay, try five drops in water, drink that and see how you feel. Try that for a few days. If they say, you know, I got a little bit of relief, I'll say, okay, let's try seven, seven drops and see how you feel with seven. And then we keep going until they say, wow, okay, now I don't have pain. Mm -hmm. So that's how we figure out the dose uh, for each person. It's very variable. I do have them keep record. I have a a book that I just finished, actually, in the back six or eight pages of the book is a little journal where you write down what dose you took, how do you feel, how was your mood, how did you sleep, how was your, what's your pain level, so that you can track it and figure out what your appropriate dose is. Mm-hmm. Excellent. That brings me to, I want to hear about your book before we wrap up, but before mm-hmm. that, I want you to talk a little bit about your products and your services you have an excellent website, janibuswellness.com, which I love the whole play on words, Janice, <laughs> cannabis. So janibuswellness.com, and there's frequently asked questions on there. There's research studies and resources. And I'll have links to all that in my show notes, as, as well as your uh, social handles and that sort of a thing. But tell us about your products and services so that people can get more information about that. So when I first started doing this, I didn't have my own product. And I wanted to be able to tell people where to go to find the best quality product because the FDA did a survey and they did a study and found that 70% of the CBD products that you could purchase online were mislabeled. Mm. They either had zero CBD or significantly less or more, or they had THC when they said it's the wild west out there. Mm -hmm. So all I was looking for is a product that I could recommend. And I finally found a company in Colorado, organically grow their hemp. Everything is in house. They grow it, they dry it, they cure it, they extract it, they bottle it, they do everything there. So I said, okay, I want to, I talked to the medical director because, you know, I'm a dietitian like you and we do our research. Mm-hmm. So I, I said to him, okay, I want to recommend your product. How do I have people buy it? And he said, oh, no, we don't sell retail. We only wholesale. So we'll sell it to you and then you put your own label on it. Mm-hmm. And at first I thought, I am not getting involved. In yeah, if I, were, I was going to say, <laughs> I remember you being like, that is not what I want to do. I just want to find a good exactly. product to recommend. But I decided to bite the bullet and do it. And now, of course, I'm glad that I did because now if someone says, yeah, this didn't work, I know it's not because it was not a good quality CBD. Now we need to try a different mode of administration Mm -hmm. or a different dose. Interesting. So that's what I did. And that's, so I I have the tinctures, the topicals, the dog chews, the soft gels. And I also offer consulting. So if someone has a condition and they want to talk online, either Zoom or on the phone, I walk them through, I have them fill out a form, tell me what medications you're on, what are your medical conditions, and I do some research and we work together. If people say, you know what, I just, I'm not exactly sure what product, I do complimentary phone calls. If it's just to say, hey, what do you think would be best for me? I set up an appointment and I talk with people about that. And then the book that I just wrote is called Simple Guide to CBD, Fact Fiction and a Path Forward. And I did that just because what I talk to people about, a lot of it is much of what we've just talked about. And I said, I just need a small book, not a big fat book that no one's going to read. It's just about 40, 50 pages. Mm -hmm. And it's just the basics. What's the endocannabinoid system? What's a cannabinoid? What's a terpene? How do you know how much to take? Uh, A little bit about the history. So that is actually doing, I think my designer has it doing the final edits. So hopefully that'll be out in the next couple of weeks. So it should be out by the time this show airs. And yeah, Simple Guide to CBD, and it will be on Amazon and on my website. Excellent. Congratulations. That that was a pleasant surprise when you told me you were doing a book. I'm like, yes. And I'll definitely link to that in my show notes as well. That sounds wonderful. Well, is there anything else you wanted to say about cannabis, CBD, the history, the myths, the stigma, or any, you know, parting words of wisdom for people? 
One thing about the stigma is when people have this sort of feeling, like, oh, cannabis or CBD, people you know are using it. They are using it. You just don't know about it because people are afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I gave a talk and a dietician called me and said, just want you to know I have inflammatory bowel disease. I have Crohn's and cannabis is the only thing that has helped me. Wow. And I said to her, can I mention that tomorrow at our dietician talk? I'm giving a talk. She said, No, because my colleagues are going to be there and nobody knows that I use it. Mm -hmm. I thought, how sad is that, that we can't share that we're using this as a medicine? And people do judge. Mm -hmm. They do. I, you know, I was there five years ago, four years ago. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, really? They're using cannabis? Oh, wow. And yet it's perfectly acceptable to have a glass of wine with dinner. Mm -hmm. And yet it's not acceptable to take a hit off of a joint or to take a a cannabis tincture to help you sleep. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And then the the other thing I want to mention is that if anyone is interested and they go to my website and say, you know, I want to give it a try, I have a, a promo code, CALM, C-A-L-M, mm-hmm. CALM will get people 15% off. Oh, very um, nice. I actually did this for my clients back in March when this whole COVID thing hit. Oh, yeah. And I put it on my website for through Mother's Day. And I thought, great, you know, we need a little CALM for a couple of months and everything's going to be back to normal. <laughs> It has not gotten back to normal, so I've just extended the discount till the end of the year. Oh, how nice. Goodness knows where. (laughs) I don't know. I'm going to keep it up there until I feel more calm about where we are with everything. That's very nice of you. Yeah, we're, what, six months into this now, and it shows no signs Mm -hmm. of slowing down. So, Mm -mm. yeah, and, and we didn't even talk about that extra layer of stress and anxiety and uncertainty that everybody has right now, but certainly... Yes. We need all the tools in our exactly. toolbox and resources exactly. because mental health is important and physical health, mm-hmm. living pain-free, it's essential for quality of life. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. I'm so excited for you and just thrilled for your success and for all the people that you're helping. Thank you for being my friend and I'll, I promise not to steal your coat again. <laughs> it's always great to talk to you, Melissa, and keep up your great work. Thank you so much, Janice. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food and CBD with health in mind. Till next time. Hey, everybody. September is National Family Meals Month, and the folks at the Food Marketing Institute have some phenomenal materials, including infographics, videos, key messages, and more to help engage and inspire people to enjoy the benefits of family mealtime, especially now as we are six months into the pandemic. Family meals have certainly seen some changes. Mainly, people are definitely eating more family meals together. And now it's important that they appreciate the benefits from this and continue more family meals in the future and post-pandemic. This year's campaign is Stay Strong with Family Meals, Because family meals have always been one of the best healthy habits, family meals keep us connected, and family meals are the foundation for a healthy nation. In fact, new consumer insights and research published in the Journal of Nutrition Education and Behavior earlier this year confirm that Americans are using family meals to stay strong, both physically and emotionally, during the pandemic, and that more frequent family meals are associated with better dietary outcomes. In particular, family meals improve fruit and vegetable consumption. Overwhelmingly, studies show a positive relationship between family meal frequency and fruit and vegetable intake. So it's no wonder that September is also National Fruits and Veggies Month. I encourage you to visit fmi.org slash family meals for more information and resources like the toolkits and infographics. I'll put links in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com slash 160 to those resources, the Journal of Nutrition, Education, and Behavior article, press releases, and the National Fruit and Veggie Month info as well. Thanks again for listening, and stay tuned for future episodes. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG in Detroit Podcasts.